Now we'll get uh, right to our first session about global and domestic market review and invite our panelists, uh, Dr. William Strauss, to the vir virtual stage. Uh, Bill is the president and founder of Future Metrics. Uh, Bill and his team are recognized as the leading experts in the wood pellet sector. Bill continues to be a thought leader in the sector and has published numerous papers on a variety of subjects relevant to our sector. He's also a founder and director of Maine Energy Systems, the largest manu uh, manufacturer of European style automatic pellet fuel uh, central heating systems in North America. So fasten your seat belts and I'll pass the screen and the mics over to you, Bill. Take it away. Thank you, Gord. Uh, hello to everybody. Good morning, good evening, uh, whatever. Um, I'm going to be rather quick. I've got quite a dense slide deck here. Uh, the intention is for those of you who find particular slides of interest to come back later when the uh, presentations are available and take your time to digest uh, some of the data. So I'm going to go rather quickly uh, through about 40 slides in about 20 minutes. So hang on. I'll do very quickly just a few introductory slides uh, about future metrics. Uh, you can look later at the list of some of our uh, clients, et cetera. Uh, some of our key personnel. Uh, the one I might point out is, um, <clears throat> of course, John Swan, who we'll all miss seeing at the live event this year because of his, well, fabulous person, but also his pellet smoked ribs that have become a traditional part of the WPAC conference. Hopefully next year, as Vaughn suggested. Okay, so we're going to talk uh, quickly about the wood pellet markets in general, and then we'll dive in a little bit to, into some specifics. The upper right corner gives you a statistic uh, in 2019, approximately 40 million, almost 40 million metric tons of wood pellets were produced globally. <clears throat> That's including the heating markets and the industrial markets. And you can see the breakdown here by uh, regions. Uh, Europe had a pretty strong head start on the rest of the world, but the North American growth has been on par more or less with European growth uh, since uh, it's, it began uh, increasing. Uh, the Asian markets are coming on strong, although last year there was a bit of a hiatus uh, as the uh, South Korean markets uh, took a bit of a break. And uh, this slide uh, gives you a breakdown of the heating pellet demand across the major countries that use pellets. I might point out that Canada is a bit of a blip on the top of the bars there, the green chunk, not very large, particularly compared to the US and some other countries such as Italy. And I know we're going to hear more about the domestic Canadian markets uh, to come here uh, later on in the, uh, in the uh, conference, uh, but a couple of slides just suggesting some of the challenges. And one of them is uh, many of the provinces uh, use a lot of electricity and natural gas for heat. And in most of those provinces where electricity is quite prominent, it's also rather cheap, although not so much true in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, so one of the challenges is competing against uh, low cost uh, natural gas and electricity uh, in many of the provinces. In this uh, slide, which I'll go over rather, rather quickly, essentially shows you what the savings are per household by switching to pellets based on electric resistance heating. Uh, and uh, you can see, by the way, Northwest Territories at the bottom of the table there, it's a, a no brainer, put in a pellet boiler. <laughs> and what would promote change in that market, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this from Dutch and probably Jamie later on, uh, is somehow or another producing either a, uh, a penalty or an incentive uh, for using fossil fuels. And it's coming. And I'll, I'm gonna hit on this topic a couple more times during this presentation uh, on greenhouse gas emissions mitigation becoming front and center for all nations, including even the United States in the, in the coming years. But here we see a, a table of heating oil, a taxes on heating oil in many, most of the EU countries and you can see that on the far, the far two columns without taxes, pellets sometimes have an advantage, but sometimes not so much, and sometimes not even an advantage at all. With taxes, pellets are always better, and sometimes they're much better. 
So dealing with carbon emissions, uh, carbon dioxide emissions is critical and it will come. And here's why it's gonna come, climate change. I think you all, many of you have seen this chart before, I've been using it for a few years, but I think it's quite uh, illustrative of what's going on over the span of 250 years. We're going to release all the carbon that was sequestered over hundreds of millions of years. This is the fossil fuel age, essentially from the 1800s to, I don't know, 2150, 2200, whenever it's gone. But the peak is sometime in the next now or maybe the next year, who knows, next 20 years, but it's gonna peak. The point is a lot of carbon being released in a short period of time. And here you can see the impact. This is CO2 concentrations of the atmosphere. The last 150 years, it's taken off. And this, the, the, the um, x-axis on this uh, chart is highly, is nonlinear, it's highly compressed for the old stuff. So we're going back 800,000 years of history here. Uh, and only in recent times have we seen anything like that. And then my last chart on climate change, uh, and this kind of gets to the point as to why I think policy will evolve. Um, this, you, you can read this a little more closely later, but essentially what it's showing is we're having an increase in variability and severity in weather-related disasters. And unpredictability with increasing cost is anathema to capitalism. Uh, nobody, investors want to have certainty and predictability and not increasing costs. So this is going to motivate change, even amongst those that may not think it's necessary right now. It's just going to become too expensive to ignore. Uh, this is a chart courtesy of Jen Jenkins from Viva. Thank you. Uh, it does a really nice job of showing the sort of uh, cycle here and the difference between hydrocarbons and carbohydrates, both of which have somewhat similar molecular structures. And hydrocarbons actually used to be carbohydrates a long time ago, right? <laughs> and uh, just a quick shot on why uh, pellets make a lot of sense. This is from a dashboard that's uh, free to use on our website. Uh, for a typical scenario, it's about an 85% reduction in CO2 emissions because you have to take into account the supply chain. And finally, uh, a chart on the UK power load, and you can see the pellet supply of power is the nice green steady chart bar near the bottom just above nuclear. And where the arrow is pointing, uh, the wind wasn't blowing very hard and the sun definitely wasn't shining, it was nighttime. And the demand was picked up by natural gas, that's the blue stuff. But what that shows is we have a renewable source of energy that's there when you need it or is baseload, unlike uh, many others. So here's the uh, demand, the forecast for the industrial wood pellet sector uh, going out to 2025. Um, and I have a couple of things in the right column. UK post 2027, when subsidy schemes expire, uh, what's going to happen to that almost 10 million tons a year of demand? Uh, we'll see. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then notice that Canada and the U.S. are nowhere on that chart. Quick overview of the markets. Uh, I expect you to read every number in that table now. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, biggest exporters, U.S. in order, are U.S., Vietnam, et cetera, Canada third. And then biggest importers, U.K. by far, uh, South Korea and on down the list. Uh, Japan is number five right now, but coming up uh, the list. And by the way, Italy is heating pellets, not industrial pellets. Got a few maps on the next few slides that just illustrate where these pellets are going on the exports from uh, the US. Uh, a good chunk of them going into the UK, uh, nothing going into Japan yet. Uh, but what's I like to uh, point out about a chart like this, a Sankey diagram, is just how um, much this market has grown and how diversified the export sector is. Even though it's heavily reliant on the UK right now, uh, there are other customers. This is the Canadian export Sankey chart. In this case, 61% of the exports go to the UK and 23, this is the percent of Japan in 2019. So this is the last, obviously the last full year of data. Uh, and you can see again, highly diversified. If we now look at the import diagrams, uh, UK imported close to 9 million tons in 2019, most of it from the United States and Canada, but 
from other locations as well, and some actually within uh, uh, European area. And then Japan is of great interest. And here is the metrics for Japan. Actually, uh, Canada used to be the main uh, supplier. It's now Vietnam, but Canada is still a, a major player in the uh, Canadian, in the Japanese market. What about prices? Well, everybody is, people often see the spot price index from Argus. This is it going back quite a distance in time to 2009. And you can see it's been up and down and it's right now down. Um, the spot market index is valuable and it sort of gives an indication of some things going on in the markets, but the majority of wood pellets are traded on bilateral contractual agreements. That is, they're not subject to changes on a spot basis. They're known contracts, fixed or, or almost fixed volumes and pricing schemes that are well known in advance and don't aren't impacted by supply and demand imbalances. Uh, just we're always curious to kind of know what the actual prices are uh, for imports into countries. So what we've done is we every month we gather international trade data and we estimate uh, what those prices are. Uh, and so here's a few countries we're going to take a look at. Uh, CIF, that is delivered prices. Uh, first, just the trend in the Japanese market. Uh, you can see here that uh, it's growing steadily, and this is monthly, by the way. So in recent months, Japan's been importing somewhere between 150 and 200,000 tons per month of wood pellets. And this is, it's a bit of a messy looking chart, but uh, just kind of drill down on the more solid line there. Uh, and this is showing you essentially what Japan is paying for pellets to come across the border into the country. Uh, and uh, you can see the um, two major suppliers, Canada and Vietnam, uh, have somewhat different uh, pricing levels. Uh, the Canadian pellets have been averaging somewhere around 190 ton. That's delivered, CIF, that's after shipping. Um, and Vietnamese pellets are much lower. Uh, somewhere recently around 160 ton, a ton. And the trend is actually following the Vietnamese uh, price history because uh, Vietnam uh, now dominates the market share uh, in, uh, into the uh, Japanese market. And you can see here where Canada and Vietnam sort of switched going back a couple of years. Uh, a good reason for this is excess capacity in Vietnam as a, as a result of some changes in the South Korean market, which I'll hit on in just a second. But in red on this slide, I want you to note that uh, the Japanese uh, government is currently working on sustainability rules. Uh, right now, there are no formal government enforced rules on sustainability in Japan. Uh, that's coming. And we're watching very carefully the evolution of that policy in Japan. Uh, those rules will be promulgated in six to months to 12 months, perhaps a little bit longer. Uh, once those rules are promulgated, uh, we're expecting to see some of these current suppliers, which are supplying more or less on a spot market, uh, quite challenged. Uh, we also expect to see palm kernel shell uh, imports a bit challenged. Maybe not all the palm kernel shells, but some. Uh, some palm oil plantations will have difficulty meeting Japanese sustainability requirements. And Japan imports a lot of palm kernel shells. Uh, the uh, primary market in Japan is small independent power producers being supported by a feed-in tariff. And those boilers are typically fluidized bed systems, which can accept a wide variety of fuels, including palm kernel shells and pellets. Uh, the reason they have contracted agreements for pellets is for financing re reasons. Uh, in order to get these projects financed, they need security of fuel supply, and you can't get that from the palm kernel shell market. It, the PKS market is essentially a bunch of aggregators bringing together product from thousands and thousands of farms and hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of uh, mills. Um, you, can't, you can't do long-term contracts in that market. So a couple more slides, uh, and then we'll uh, kind of try to wrap this thing up in just a few minutes. Uh, let's take a look at England. Uh, monthly imports, quite a bit larger. 
somewhere in the neighborhood of 800,000 tons a month. And just as an extra bonus, what the value of those imports are, uh, approximately between 140 million and 160,000 US dollars per month is the input value of pellets into the UK. This is a big market. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a big market here. And here, this is a much messier slide than the one in Japan because there's a lot more suppliers. Uh, but essentially, the, the, the punchline is that the average of all these, the weighted average based on trade inflows, is somewhere around 190 a ton coming into the UK. And market share for the UK uh, is dominated by the US, Canada is second, and then just below Canada is Latvia, which also actually exports pellets from several of the other uh, Baltic countries. Uh, and then the rest of the suppliers bouncing along the bottom. South Korea, just very quickly, uh, it's quite sketchy <laughs> uh, as uh, understanding any certainty of demand there. And this is the primary reason. Uh, REC prices, these are renewable energy certificates. They're essentially uh, issued for every megawatt hour of renewable power you produce. Uh, there's excess supply of these things in uh, South Korea. The prices have collapsed uh, in recent uh, months. And as a result, uh, the South Koreans have, uh, are importing uh, quite a bit less. In fact, you can see uh, they peaked at about 350,000 tons a month uh, back in November of uh, 18. And uh, the, recently, it's around 200, 250,000 tons a month uh, these days. In fact, uh, it seems to be on a downtrend. And prices in the uh, South Korea are quite a bit lower. Uh, it's dominated once again by Vietnam. And you can see CIF delivered prices of about $110 a ton. Very difficult market to make money in. And there's no long-term agreements. Well, almost no long-term agreements, certainly none with the big utilities that are co-firing. Uh, and by the way, Canada is highlighted there in the blue line. Looks like uh, Canadians are getting a lot of money for the pellets, but if we look at the market share, uh, there actually aren't that many pellets being shipped out of Canada. Canada is right along the bottom there. Uh, it hardly shows up, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, Vietnam is the dominant uh, supplier after uh, coming second is Malaysia. So just a few more slides and then I'll be done uh, with this rather dense public uh, presentation. I hope you all uh, take the time to review it later and look in a little more detail at some of these slides. But this is really, I think, uh, what I wanna get across here uh, today in this presentation is what's next? What if policy evolves? Right now, we're looking at end of support of the schemes in, U in Europe and the UK not that far out in the future. In the UK, 2027 is a big year. Um, what's gonna happen after that? Well, as I said earlier in the presentation, I think climate change is becoming front and center. It's becoming clear and present. It's been one of those things that policymakers in some countries, not all, have been able to ignore or even deny. That's not gonna last much longer. And I think we all see evidence of that, uh, even, uh, even in the United States. Uh, so let's suppose that pellets are continued to use well into the 2030s. Um, at the bottom there in relatively small print, uh, I just wanna point out that there's still a huge number of coal-fired, coal coal-fueled power stations in the world. Uh, the U.S. alone has 482 plants that are larger than 100 megawatts still operating. And this table breaks it down for the U.S. and Germany. We have data, by the way, on every country in the world on coal plants, but we're looking at just two major uh, coal-dependent countries. Uh, the United States, 482 still operating, uh, Germany, 83. About half have, have been shut down in both countries, but many of those plants that are still running are relatively new. Uh, I think if my memory is correct, there's 15 or 20 plants in the US that are less than 12 years old. That's the classic stranded asset. So we think it's quite likely if policy evolves, as it should, that there will be demand for co-firing, uh, not only in Germany or even maybe full conversions in some cases, but yet, in the United States. Maybe in a couple of years at the WPAC conference, we can revisit my prediction. And if I'm wrong, I'll buy you dinner. Maybe not everybody on this call. Um, so we've looked at 
just in the United States alone, we've looked at characteristics of locations of coal stations, and we found a number of places where they're actually in great locations. They're actually in locations with ripe, sustainable wood baskets that are unsuitable for export markets. There's no, the logistics of getting the pellets from those locations in the center of the country near the coal uh, stations is not favorable for export, but it would be favorable to feed a coal plant right next door. So we think the, the, all the necessary conditions are in place. All we need is policy. And of course, what are the limits to growth? Well, that's always a question that comes up. So let's just assume we're going to throw a, a 50 million ton a year limit to the industrial wood pellet sector. By the way, I think that's quite conservative. I think there's a lot, lot more room for growth than that. But if that's the case, let's, this scenario is a what if the US, Canada, Australia join and Germany join the party. And uh, here we have it, 50 million tons a year of wood pellet demand by 2030. I, I think this is a plausible scenario. And what we need to do and what WPAC uh, is doing is making sure that policymakers around the world realize that this is a fundamental and ready to deploy solution to decarbonization. Um, and then finally, what actually, um, this is my last slide actually, uh, like I said, what happens over the next 10 years eh, may or may not come close to matching the forecast, we'll see. But if policy evolves as it should, industrial wood pellets will be a critical part of the solution, absolutely. We just have to make sure that's baked into policy in the coming years. With that, I'll take questions. By the way, that's uh, me in full COVID mode. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Everybody's often asked me what I look like without a ponytail. So there is, that's a worst case scenario. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, that certainly gave us a lot to think about. Uh, we've got a few questions already, and I just want to remind everyone listening that you can type in your questions at any time using the GoToWebinar question feature on the right of your screen. Um, let's start with asking um, the screen about the CIF prices for pellets to the UK from Canada. Uh, those have dropped over the past two years. Why is that exactly? So, I think I understood you correctly. Why has the CIF price to the UK dropped over the last few years? It's it's really um, a matter of contracts rolling over in recent years. At least that's my impression. I think there's producers here that could give a better uh, reasoning behind this, perhaps, or a more uh, uh, experienced uh, understanding. But um, as uh, some of the earlier contracts uh, into uh, Drax, for example, uh, were pretty generous basis prices with uh, pretty decent annual escalators uh, so that some producers are getting well north of 200, 210 a ton uh, for their pellets going to Drax. As those contracts expire, I think they're being renewed at prices that are kind of more in line with what's uh, what's sustainable for everybody on both sides. Whether the, So the producer can still make a margin uh, and the generator still has uh, has slightly cheaper fuel. Right. Okay. Uh, we have another question asking if the Japanese government has stated an intent to eliminate nuclear power. No, they have not stated their intent to eliminate nuclear power. Uh, they uh, there's an expectation that some of the nuclear plants will be coming back online. A few have actually. Uh, What's highly unlikely is that many of them will come back online. Most think that nuclear is not going to become the 22 or 23 percent of the uh, capacity in Japan by 2030, as is stated in some of the government uh, goals. Uh, what's interesting about that is that if it doesn't, suppose it only makes 10 percent of the capacity, uh, in order for Japan to meet its carbon emissions goals, it's going to have to produce power from other low carbon sources and to replace new base load, uh, it's not happening with wind and solar. And that's good news for the pellet producers. Right. Okay, uh, another question. What is the CO2 combustion emissions difference between coal combustion and wood pellet combustion? It's very similar. It depends on the kind of coal. Uh, and uh, 
don't don't forget coal used to be wood more or less or at least uh, biomass a long long time ago uh, so the uh, carbon contents are, are fairly similar it just depends it depends on moisture content and the type of coal some low-grade coals actually uh, emit more co2 than pellets when burned and some higher grade coals less uh, they both emit a fair portion. Uh, sometimes you'll see comparisons of CO2 emissions between green wood chips and coal. In that case, wood emits significantly more CO2 per unit of energy than coal uh, because you're losing a lot of energy evaporating water in green wood chips. But pellets are dry, so you don't have that problem. Uh, but what's always has to be considered in the story is that uh, every molecule of CO2 released in wood combustion is absorbed contemporaneously by new growth, as long as the sustainability requirements are met. That's not the case with coal, where, as I showed earlier on, millions and millions of years of carbon sequestration is released over a period of a couple centuries. Uh, it's impossible for uh, growth of uh, biological, uh, you know, green things to absorb that that quickly. That's why it's, the atmosphere is taking up so much uh, CO2. So wood pellets uh, are essentially carbon neutral in combustion as long as the sustainability piece is in place. There's always CO2 uh, brought into the carbon footprint in the supply chain from fossil fuels used for transport, et cetera. That's the case with coal or any other fuel that has to be uh, extracted, refined, and delivered. Great, okay. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. With the structural demand headwinds facing the European market after 2025 or 2027, how much additional room for greenfield pellet capacity is viable from the USGC with all of Inviva's announced projects? Yeah, well, if I knew the answer to that, I, I, I think uh, Inviva would probably hire me or somebody else to help them do their strategy. Uh, it's a really tough question. Um, what is happening is we're seeing some capacity the growth in the Asian markets, especially Japan, uh, is uh, soaking up uh, some of the capacity. Uh, but I think there's a, a big structural unknown coming in the second half of this decade, for sure. Uh, and how that's handled, we'll see. There's a lot of capacity that's supplying the U European market right now. Uh, just the UK alone is going to be close to 10 million tons a year uh, come 2026. Uh, it's hard to imagine that going to zero in 2028. Um, that's why we think policy will evolve one way or another. And of course, this is you know, Bill's idea of where policy will go uh, and others as well, uh, isn't sufficient to uh, finance a project, uh, but uh, we are pretty confident that pellet consumption will not only continue uh, in that area, but will actually grow. Uh, but right now, it would be pretty impossible to finance a new pellet project for a UK market with only six years of, of uh, or, or maybe even five or six years left in their uh, support scheme. That's not enough time to uh, cover uh, the debt needed to build a project of that size. Okay, uh, we'll have one last question. Uh, what will the impact of the old growth review just released, I believe in BC, um, be on our industry? And as an association, what actions are uh, being taken to uh, with the NDP government, I think that's very specific to BC. I don't know if you can speak to that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of that, uh, the uh, document that was just referenced, so I really can't comment on that. Uh, just in general terms, uh, pellet producers have to meet very strict sustainability criteria in order for their pellets to qualify for support schemes in, in the countries they export to. Uh, there's no way uh, you can harvest wood that's considered uh, Non, a non-sustainable product and old growth in most cases it depends on the location uh, if it's not a working forest if it's not something that's employed for the forest products industry in general uh, through uh, tenure agreements uh, then it's off limits so i don't think uh, we'll see uh, protected for well i know we will never see protected forests at least not from those who uh, play by the rules Okay, uh, unfortunately, we are now out of time for the questions, but uh, for anyone whose questions we didn't answer, you can email Bill uh, later on, and we'll again make these presentations available to everyone in a couple of days. Thanks very uh, much. Thank just, just to let everybody know, my house is right, right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill.